So, and, you know, how much of our definition of consciousness is just to, so that we feel special? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think quite that, that's a profound point. And it's, it's driven a lot of confusion about our relationship. I mean, you'll know this, Neil, as an astrophysicist, right? I mean, the, the thought that we are special was what led people for the longest time to think that we're at the center of the universe. So a, oh, so plus it kind of looked that way. <laughs> You know, in all fairness, <laughs> standing true. on Earth, the whole universe revolved around us. So it wasn't completely in conflict with evidence until it was. That's all. That is that is true. And then, of course, Darwin did something similar with our nature as creatures, pointing out that we're also not special in the sense of being created by God in a different way from all other. All that. We're related to all other animals. And so, yeah, in that sense, consciousness is. So the last refuge of human exceptionalism. (laughs) Beautiful sentence. That we feel that human consciousness is somehow really special and it sets us apart. Uh, Descartes made this very explicit. He called non-human animals uh, beast machines or or bête machine in the French. Mm. Um, And trying to make the point there that non-human animals were just flesh and blood mechanisms, robots made out of living material that didn't have the kind, at least didn't have the kind of consciousness that mattered for for moral consideration. So we do have this track record and we've kind of got around it in in most ways now. We no longer think we're at the center of the universe. We no longer think that we're unrelated to all other creatures. And we, most of us, I think there's a wide consensus that we're not the only conscious creatures out there. Just ask your cat. Ask a cat, yeah. <laughs> if you could ask a cat. You can ask a cat. They just won't answer until you've left the room. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, so are there theories of consciousness? And, I, you know, I've seen a lot of isms out there, right? Dualism, monism, materialism. Are these all ways to try to get into this mysterious place that is our mind? They're all ways of thinking about the problem, or they're sort of things that come before the theories. They're philosophical theories. So consciousness seems to be this incredibly mysterious thing because on the one hand, we are physical creatures. We're made of stuff and complicated stuff, but it's stuff, um, or it seems to be stuff anyway. And on the other hand, there are conscious experiences. So intuitively, it might seem that the physical world is very different from the world of conscious experience and that no explanation in terms of physics and chemistry will tell you how or why anything or anyone is conscious. This is what David Chalmers called the hard problem of consciousness. I know he's been on on your show um, before. And and the idea that they're totally unrelatable is is dualism. They operate in separate realms. And you've got a whole bunch of other isms, but they're not really theories. They're the sort of perspective that you might take from which you might then build a theory. Let me interject there. When someone comes up to me and says, "Uh, Dr. Tyson, I have a theory and I say, no, Einstein had a theory. You have a hypothesis, <laughs> just to be clear. Because <laughs> in the physical science, a theory is a fully tested explanation of phenomena that makes successful predictions. I, I don't know if that's getting semantic about the word theory, but many people say, oh, it's just a theory without recognizing that at least in the physical sciences, a theory is the highest form of understanding we have. No, I think that's right. I think a theory is the goal, isn't it? And, or a, a well-tested and empirically well-established and explanatorily powerful theory. That, that's the goal. And I would say in consciousness, we have proto-theories. There are the beginnings of theories. Some are more ambitious <laughs> than others, but none of them have reached the level of maturity that we've seen in physics with relativity, quantum mechanics, all of, all of these things. Now, I mean, they are, they are still theories. So they make predictions and they explain observations about you know, what happens in the brain. Because one of the amazing things about consciousness. Philosophically, it seems incredibly mysterious, but it has this amazing advantage that brains are relatively numerous, relatively accessible, you know, compared to the the Big Bang or the, the very small world of quantum mechanics. I mean, we can we can look inside a living human brain as people gain consciousness, lose consciousness, change their consciousness. So we can study it in in a sense much more easily than some of the other frontiers of mystery. And that's great because then we can begin to use this evidence to constrain and, and improve the theories that we have. You talk about it as a myst- mystery. Um, is consciousness broken down into different kind of s- types, segments, or, or is it just one big thing? 
I, I prefer that kind of divide and conquer approach, actually, uh, because if you treat it as one big scary mystery in need of one massive eureka solution, it it, it can be very resistant. It can be resistant in, even in the sense of what would a satisfying answer look like? You know, what what would we be content with in terms of an explanation? And in many other areas of science, this kind of divide and conquer approach has has, has paid dividends. There's a good parallel, I yes, think, it has. with with the history of life. It's, it's reductionism. At yeah, that level. yeah, yeah. Uh, let me add something here. The in in early days of physics and uh, all the branches of physics, uh, philosophers played very important roles to help shape questions and help the direction of things. But that was evidence that the field was still in its infancy when you had philosophers sort of running amok among you. And it looks like you have philosophers at every turn when you're trying to arrive at some conclusions here. And at what point will you be evidence-based and no longer will the philosopher in the armchair be useful to you because all of your answers are coming from the lab and not from their brains? I think philosophers are in it for the long game with consciousness. And what, one of the things I've seen over the last 30 years that I've been doing this stuff is, is the dialogue between philosophy and, and science has become richer. Certain things that may have started purely philosophical have now become you know, the realm of the lab. And, and that's great. Yeah, that's how most things would be. But once it's in the lab, the philosopher is a little less useful, that's all I'm saying, because your answers are coming from the lab. I think the point, right, certainly the point we're at right now is that philosophy is still extremely useful because we're still a bit confused about what the questions we should ask are and how to interpret the answers. And the theories that are coming mm -hmm. up still have quite a philosophical flavor. And also the, the implications are hugely important and they will remain philosophical. Like, yes, we can have an understanding of what happens in the brain when someone loses consciousness or so on. But what do we do with that understanding? What do we do with our understanding of consciousness in terms of how we treat other animals, how we treat um, brain-injured humans, and indeed what we do with AI? It's always going to be a All way. right. So from that last bit that you just said, what is the difference between the function of, or, or something that functions like consciousness, and what we feel, because let's be honest, it's the true knowing that we have. Yeah, you know, consciousness for individuals is this like very visceral and intense knowing. And we, if we cannot ascribe that to something else, then we say it's not conscious. But yet there are things that function as consciousness, like tree root networks. It allows the trees to literally talk to one another and, and I need more water and that tree gets more water or, you know, uh, I need to fight off this particular fungi. Like, and that is a kind of knowing, but we won't say they're conscious. We'll just say that's a function. So where do you find the balance and difference to make that differentiation? Yeah, it's, it's a really tricky um, tightrope to walk because, you know, on the one hand, we have to use human way of being as a kind of benchmark because we know that we are conscious and, and that's that's a starting point if you like but we don't want to be too again anthropocentric and, and see everything through this through this human lens and not every function is going to need consciousness now, i'm a sort of mm -hmm. materialist so i like, like to think of, of consciousness as a biological property that that arose in evolution gradually um but to perform certain functions, to enable certain functions in creatures where it was useful. And so we have to ask, well, what does consciousness do for us and where might it be in the rest of, of biology then? And again, there's lots of different answers to this, but consciousness for us seems to bring like a, a ton of information together in this kind of unified way. So you said, you know, we know, we have this sense of knowing, and that seems to be this kind of thing. You open your eyes in the morning and there's a whole unified world out there and you can just experience everything going on around you your alarm clock smell of coffee whatever it is you experience your body and you experience you know, what you might do next i can't tell you how much time i've spent contemplating the fact that every morning i wake up as me and not as someone else that's because you're not in the quantum leap <laughs> okay <laughs> All right, I'm in the wrong show. You're okay. in the wrong show, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> get out of here. Well, why, why would you? Why would you expect to be someone else when you woke up? It's not that I expect to be. I just wonder why I'm not. 
it's not a matter of expectations. It's there's 8 billion people in the world. Why am I persistently me? What is it about me that makes me me every day I wake up? But the other, the other possibility is, in fact, you're, you're overestimating the extent to which you remain you from day to day. You know, it's, it's, it's like, Ooh, if you think about, yes. you're not you, but you're not you, Neil. <laughs> you're not you, man. And Neil, I need further explanation on that sentence. <laughs> but just think about Neil deGrasse Tyson at the age of 10 or something. You know, is, is that yes. really the same person? Well, I have memories from that age. From that age, I have memories. But our experiences will alter us, if you like, microscopically to the point where a decade later, we aren't quite that same person. No, no, I, I get that. But I have the same memories of mm -hmm. events that occurred. Well, you think you do. But actually, the more often you, you recall something, the less accurate that memory is. That's what they say. But I work hard to avoid that. So you, we can wear a memory out. Is that what you're saying? You experience it differently when you remember it, and then you remember hmm. it again, and you experience it differently when you remember it. And so every time a cell makes a copy of itself, it's, you know, not the best cell. <laughs> <laughs>